And then you know, the pain thing, you know, my brother has this pain, and, and now they're, uh, there's all this therapy where they, they actually direct the uh, medication. I don't know what it was final cord. Could we, could we keep those uh, big lights on? Um, I don't start to mine it for about uh, 15 minutes. Maybe they should project the video on us. No. since film noir. <laughs> Just don't look up. Where am I so close? Yeah, that's true. We could do that. I guess we're going to leave the light off. Maybe. Is that the light they're going to use? We should turn that off. Doesn't that light bother you, David, that light? Does it bother me, that one? That one. Another one on our phone. Yeah, it does. I prefer not to be there, but it was on the choice of that and darkness. I prefer the light. I think they're just going to say Let me give you the I had a phone call from John Gannon this morning saying he was going to try and get here. Oh, he's amazing. He makes up to everything. Yes. Yeah. It would be fun to see. Do you live on the website? Yeah. Days we need to go in. I usually manage just to. That's good. Do you have tenure? Yeah. I just got to. That helps. Yeah. <laughs> Doing the two. I don't think there's still the same kind of resentment against people living in Los Angeles. Well, there can't be because, because so many of the young, young people do. And that's just the way it is. People have complicated family situations. That's the way it is everywhere from what I hear. Probably less so in, in the major urban areas. I mean, places like Yale, it's, um, everybody lives in New York. Hi. How you doing? <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. I'd also li like to thank SciArc for the use of their auditorium and their tech staff. Um, it's a pleasure for the Landon Foundation to be able to work in collaboration with LACE on this series, and I hope that you'll be able to join us for the other conversations on video art. Um, which are happening on November 9th and November 16th. Um, our moderator this afternoon is Erica Sudberg. She's an artist and writer and professor at um, UC Riverside. She will introduce our panelists. And after the talk, we hope you'll come over and see the Bill Viola installation, which is up at the Landon Foundation. We're open until 5 o'clock, and the show will be up until December 22nd. Thanks. So if this is too loud, you can just scream or flee or one of the other two things. Um, I would like to very, very briefly talk and introduce some of the panelists uh, by way of talking a little bit about video history, which in and of itself is a fairly odd notion. Um, the history of video art is definitely mutable and overarchingly inclusive, um, as I think will be made clear by our panelists today. Uh, it's the only art form that has been aligned with the ascension of a single corporation, which is Sony, which is something that I always like to think about, uh, a corporately sort of funded and supported art form, not, not today, but in its, its uh, beginning. 
Uh, it's definitely a multitask uh, in the sense, multitask in the sense that it addresses both alternative and sometimes opposing applications. Um, I think its presence in the art world today is open to a lot of speculation, particularly with the advent of computer arts and electronic arts in general, what precisely the role would be of video art in the 90s. Um, video art was also engaged uh, very highly with 60s utopian projects of placing the means of production in the hands of uh, in the hands of the people, in quotes, uh, thereby giving voice and developing centers of experimentation and activism. Um, and much of the strains of video art developed um, in separately and did not necessarily uh, talk to one another, which is also interesting. The other aspect of video art that always seems quite curious is its development alongside and sometimes, um, again, not, uh, not linking up with the history of experimental film, something that David James will address. Um, in terms of its multitasking uh, focus, it has been involved in elaborate installation sculptural components that are dependent on the parameters of the art world and large museum support. Uh, it has been involved in appropriation and reprogramming of the televisual landscape, certainly in the 80s with appropriation where TV, TV babies make uh, video about television. Um, it certainly in the 60s and the 70s was involved in re-landscaping television through a series of very interesting and to this point in the United States almost defunct alternative experimental television centers. And video art resides today in a widely divergent um, set of circumstances from activist video to sculpture uh, to video um, that resides particularly in the art world. Um, I posed several almost unanswerable questions to the panelists, which they will either choose to ignore or to address, which is their option, in the hopes that we could open up a discussion of what video may constitute, uh, both within their work as producers and writers, but also within the larger question of the media arts. And the questions very briefly that I posed to them was, how did video art as a genre form? Uh, what might a history of video art be? Where is video art constituted in contemporary art? What sites of resistance, change, and mutation do you see forming? And has or will video as an art form function? How does it function for you in your own work? Uh, what production and past history do you find intriguing or engaging? And what are the components of a history of the art form that bear repeating, outlining, and conversely, which aspects of the canon deserve critiquing and debunking? Uh, and those are some of the questions that I ask them, and uh, now I would actually like to introduce them. The format for this afternoon is very simple. They will be presenting the aspects of video art that they wish to address uh, briefly, and then hopefully we can open it up for discussion, both amongst the panelists, but hopefully also inclusive of you to see what you're thinking about. Uh, our first uh, presenter is David James, who is a professor in the Division of Critical Studies in the Department of Film and Television at USC. He is the author of Allegories of Cinema, American Film in the 60s, and the editor of To Free the Cinema, Jonas Mikas in the New York Underground, and The Hidden Foundation, Cinema and Questions of Class. He is currently a fellow at the Getty Center for the Arts and Humanities, and is working on a book concerning the history of experimental film and video in Los Angeles. David? Thank you. As Eric has said, I'm really a film historian rather than a video historian, so these remarks will be at a greater level of uh, generality than those of my colleagues, um, and they uh, will reflect how the history of video appears to me to be a film historian. I'm especially interested in video because at a certain point, video took over the role of avant-garde underground film people who in the late 60s uh, would have been, uh, mid 60s were uh, underground filmmakers, avant-garde filmmakers, started making video. And so the one medium displaces the other. But within that, I'm especially interested in the ways in which the material nature of the new medium, and especially the particular institutional systems it was able to amass, transformed various projects of underground film. So what I'm gonna do very briefly is talk about that moment of transition then what I see as the most important agents acting on video since the transition, and then talk about a couple of uh, aspects of uses of video in Los Angeles that I find especially important. 
I think this first uh, section about the transition is very uncontroversial and probably it will be repeated, I expect it will be repeated or at least uh, invoked by the other panelists. In the United States, uh, as after the uh, transformations in the studio system in the late 50s, there, as Erica pointed out, there was a great series of movements in which people took over various forms of film practice for themselves. People who previously only been consumers of film started making film. And by the time you get to the mid-60s, this movement had really flowered in an era that we call underground film. An underground film was characterized by a combination of simultaneously aesthetic radicalism, formal innovation, interesting things in style, and political radicalism. The two things kind of went along, hand in hand, were seen together, and the aesthetic component was understood as part and parcel of the political component. Um, usually in doing that it invoked some version of an idea called the politics of vision, which is a major strain in American thought going right back through to, uh, to Emerson, by which it was supposed that if you could transform the way in which you perceived the world, saw the world, then the transformation of the body politic would follow rapidly after that, or immediately after that. By the time you get to the late 60s, that utopian combination of discursive reference to the real world and artfulness had broken apart. The political pressures of the period, especially the Vietnam War, the Civil Rights Movement, and then the Women's Movement, so polarized the country that that combination fell apart and split. And as a result, underground film split into radical political filmmaking, community-based activist filmmaking, most of which was marshaled around a series of organizations called newsreels, who made films about the war protests, about civil rights, about women's movements, irrespective of their aesthetic properties, on the one hand, and then on the other hand, the sheer aesthetic component became reified in a moment we call structural film, which didn't appear to have very much political content, but was very much concerned with the material nature of the medium itself, with purely aesthetic qualities. So around the time that the Porter Pact first becomes available, those two options seem to polarize the general world of alternative uh, uh, movie making. And sure enough, video takes over those two positions, kind of inherits that split, uh, and so the earliest forms of video appear as, on the one hand, community, radical video making, video freaks, ant farm, various attempts to use video in radical politics on the one hand, then on the other hand, the thing that we have since that time called video art. So those two kind of poles persisted, those positions, as it were, were in, inherited from, from, from film and persisted in the early days of, uh, of video through, say, to about the mid-70s, uh, late-70s, by which time film had ceased to be a major component in subcultural or aesthetic practice, minority aesthetic practice in the United States. And that kind of split between the community-based political filmmaking and the artist's video has survived in various forms. Of course, all practices are some kind of combination of this. Things pass back and forth. And, uh, but essentially, that's passed through on to the present. At least that's the situation that was inherited. Now what I want to do is talk about the ways in which video specifically has transformed those possibilities. And I see three main versions of this. First of all, the ways in which video has, trans has been transformed in its use in community politics. I'm going to talk about that at the end of my short presentation, so I won't talk any more about it right now. But I want to talk about two other things that happened to video, say in the late 70s and early 80s. The first thing uh, was that video became museified. It became part and parcel of the apparatuses of the museum. In that, it was uh, following a path that underground film had begun to develop in the structural film period. Uh, structural film was made in the art world and it very quickly entered into the museum, but video made a position in the museum much more prominent and powerful than film had ever been able to do. And, the, and that was a very uh, laudable and interesting development, uh, had many uh, implications, but one of the most powerful implications of it was that the museums tended to encourage those works which were assimilable to the ideology and functions of the museum. That meant that really radical political activity, political activity that called into question the links between the museum and corporate capital, were not able to be assimilated into the series of practices. The other result was that video had to find a way in which it could itself be the vehicle of capital investment. 
Early video had one great advantage, was, which was that it could be reproduced infinitely. This made it much more flexible and useful than film, but from a financial point of view, that was a great disadvantage, because as soon as you rented a tape, you could copy it and make multiple versions, which meant that the tape itself uh, had very little use, or it was very difficult to become the vehicle for capital investment that it was a multi capable of multiple reproductions. And so that aspect of the art world, which needs to uh, uh, generate fu um, financial return on its investment, found video a very difficult medium to, to deploy. The result of that was that various practices which could be capable of permanent installations in museums, which could be capable of exclusive ownership, and which could be put to the uses of corporate capital became privileged in the museum use of video, specifically in the development of installations. And so installations like the one over at the Lannan, which can be part of ongoing museum um, uh, installations, which can be recruited to the uses of corporate capital behind the museums, tended to develop in a way that had been impossible for film to be developed. That seems to me to be the second major transformation of the possibilities of film. The third uh, transformation is the academy. And uh, by the mid-70s, film was becoming to be uh, a, a part of academic uh, film pro uh, university programs. But by the late 70s, video had taken over that. And we had a new generation of academics who were teaching video, talking about video, writing articles about video. And this seems to me to be a wholly positive development. Um, I would uh, uh, add that one of the uh, greatest, one of the uh, most significant developments in that is an anthology edited by Erika Suderberg uh, called Resolutions, which is, to my mind, like state-of-the-art academic attention to, to artists' video. I uh, encourage you all to buy it. But it also had another um, uh, effect, which was that academics themselves started to make video. And that coincided with the transformations of the academy itself. In the late 70s, early 80s, the American universities took over wholesale a, a very interesting um, phylum of French theory about language, about art, uh, which we usually designate as post-structuralist. And this theory was very interested in the nature of language, the relationship of language to the material world, the relationship of language to power, especially to gendered power. And so as academics uh, began to uh, approach this theory and use this theory to talk about existing artworks, video, to my mind, appeared as a wonderful medium in which art making and theory making could be bridged. That artists no longer had to make a sheer aesthetic object, nor did they have to make an object which simply related to the external world, but could make an object which combined both, uh, both uh, the aesthetic properties and the referential properties. I'd like to show you a little bit of, of tape right, right now, which exemplifies this. But before I do so, I just want to say what seems to me that made a video about video made this possible. Film had previously tried to develop an essayistic mode and tried to be, make itself used for kind of writing theory on film, but it was limited by the fact that, first of all, that the soundtrack and the image track were entirely separate. And second, because both of these retained a kind of ontological connection with the real world. The film image was somehow rooted in the real world, and it was only with great difficulty that it could be kind of liberated as an instrument of thought itself. I think video, which can combine multiple forms of images, multiple forms of sound image relations, kind of appeared on the scene at exactly the time when that kind of discursivity became a real possibility. So I want to show you now a brief selection of a videotape, also by Erika Suderberg, which seems to me to be wonderfully important in the ways in which it's able to liberate different image and soundtracks and recombine them. As you watch it, just listen for a phrase. All the impulse, listen for a phrase. All the impulses of the medium were fed into the circuitry of my dreams. All the impulses of the medium were fed into the circuitry of my dreams as if video could marshal this multiple modes of signification. Can you just show me two minutes of the first video, please? The sound.
So th this is an example of what I consider the first utopian progressive use of video. The use of video is a new kind of writing which combines elements of discourse which in the recent past and in fact since the Industrial Revolution have been rationalized, separated or divorced. Finally, I want to talk about uh, uh, how these developments in video are specific to Los Angeles. My sense is that Los Angeles is unique Alternative cultural production in Los Angeles is unique in a way that reflects two things. First of all, the centrality of Hollywood in our history and immediate environment. Hollywood is a presence that none of us can ignore, that we can't really escape in any fundamental way. And secondly, the way in which the geography of the, of the city has allowed for the construction of discrete ethnic communities. So there is in Los Angeles a separate and largely segregated black community, a Latino community, a Japanese American community, a Chinese American community. As a result of this segregation, which itself was enabled by the geographical structure of the city and the history of immigration patterns into Los Angeles, as a result of this segregation, politics, alternative politics, progressive politics in Los Angeles are largely um, mobilized in ethnic terms, in terms of ethnic identity. As a result of that, as far as I can see, progressive cultural activity in, the, in Los Angeles is kind of positioned in this space of tension between, on the one hand, Hollywood, which is an inescapable viewer. It's always there as a pull. And on the other hand, the autonomy, the integrity, and the viability of the various ethnic cultures in the city, which have never been assimilated into a single, uh, a single system. Um, the, uh, the example I want to use to illustrate this is the work of Bruce and Norman Yonimoto, and I do this with some hesitation because I suspect that Bruce doesn't like to be positioned in that way, but I have to because, uh, to my mind, Bruce and Norman Yonimoto's work is the best instance of this and the great instance of the reconciliation of these divergent poles. On the one hand, the work is very much aware of Hollywood. It's critical of Hollywood, it's self-conscious about Hollywood, it talks about Hollywood, it deals with Hollywood, it negotiates with Hollywood. But on the other hand, it's very much concerned uh, with the history of Japanese Americans in this city, with Japanese American cultures, and the ways in which Japanese Americans have lived in Los Angeles and continue to live and make art in Los Angeles. So um, as I look back over the career of Bruce and Norman Yonemoto, I'm reminded of things like Green Card, which was a, a, a videotape about how a Japanese, Ameri Japanese person became an American, but the whole tape was made in the vocabulary of a soap opera. I'm reminded about a, 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 a videotape called Hollywood, which is about how people go about making films in Hollywood. But especially I'm reminded of a marvelous installation which Bruce and Norman Yonemoto had up in Los Angeles about a year ago. I'll describe that to you very briefly. On one wall were stacked high many um, amateur movie screens, as if a whole composite screen had been made out of domestics, the kinds of screens that you'd have in your own house to show home movies. But projected onto this kind of shingled, cubist kind of huge mega screen were video clips of movies from World War II, especially those movies which are concerned to vilify and demonize the Japanese. So that was on one wall. On the other side of the room, there was a tape recorder which played clips from advertisements made in the 1950s. And I thought this was a magnificent image of the ways in which a person, especially a Japanese-American person, or by analogy, uh, any, any person, growing up in the 50s, would confront 
demonized, dehumanized images of oneself, surrounded by the crap, the detritus of advertising, but take these things together and make a work of art which both recognize that conditioning by Hollywood on the one hand, and then on the other hand, turned it over into its own self-consciousness and made it into a, a kind of statement, a, a, a metaphor of liberation from those systems. So in my mind, um, the video works of Bruce and Norman Yonemoto carry on the most progressive elements in independent filmmaking in the city, which had also been forced to negotiate between, on the one hand, the dominance, the hegemony of the Hollywood film, and on the other hand, uh, the local communities from which authentic culture can come. Finally, I want to talk one last thing about politics. And now I'm going to go back to the community uh, grassroots organization aspect. And um, as we said, um, politics in Los Angeles are organized in ethnic terms, and what this means is that class analysis is generally repressed in both the dominant culture and in the minority culture of the city. Uh, one can recognize the need for uh, the mobilization of ethnic images, but what's important about this, about the vocabulary of, of ethnicity, and especially about the limitations of the resources which can mobilize that, can house that, is that they must repress working class consciousness and attempts at working class organization. So while we do have many means of mobilizing black video, Asian American video, Latino video, what none of these institutions can do is mobilize video made on behalf of the working class, which cuts through and across these ethnic divisions. And that seems to me to be very, very important right now. Since, since the 80s, we are witnessing a very horrific class war, which is waged not against people who are able to protect themselves, not against miners and steel workers, but against the most impoverished people in the city, against people who are very, very poor, have the worst jobs, and don't have access to any of the institutions which allow for political discursivity. I work for an institution, USC, which is part of this corporate state. Which is part of this corporate state. And what USC is doing is attempting to uh, disenfranchise the least powerful of its workers, the people who work in the food services and the janitors. All these people are being outsourced. They are being sold off to subcontractors who give them no benefits, very poor wages, and uh, no, uh, no, uh, uh, no contracts. And so to me, it's very important that there should be some video which addresses that issue. And so I'd like to show, finally, a piece of video made by and on behalf of the working class by the Hotel and Service Workers Union. Thank you. OK. The geography study sums up these two views of USC in a telling graphic. Hostile territory. Interactive zones. Friendly territory. Terms appropriate to military occupation and guerrilla warfare. The strategic plan acknowledges that the price USC pays is high. USC's location in the center of Los Angeles, the strategic plan says, is perceived by many as a major negative factor in the recruitment of students and Fast forward a little bit. How is USC responding to the environment? Okay. The environmental threat to their future is USC. The issues here include wages, medical benefits, and above all, job security. The threat of unemployment when the university contracts out their jobs to building maintenance companies paying low wages and no benefits. USC has a choice in how it treats its dining and housing workers. It can add to the environmental threat it sees in Los Angeles by driving down working and living standards, by subcontracting good jobs, by forcing loyal employees into unemployment. Or it can put its strategic plan into practice. Okay, thank you. Set a high standard as the law. So those seem to me to be the, the, the ways in which the history, the uh, origins of, of underground film, the politics of that eventuate into three progressive practices of the present. 
first the kind of discursivity uh, manifested in Erika's work, which combines aesthetics and, uh, um, and um, some kind of statements about the real world. Secondly, works such as Bruce's, which negotiates between the ethnic communities and the film and consciousness industries. And third, a work made by and on behalf of the working class, which attempts to cut across the ethnic divisions which keep us isolated in the city. Thank you. I hope I didn't go on too long. Thanks. Okay. I'd like to introduce to you Amelia Jones, who is an associate professor of art history at UC Riverside and author of Postmodernism and the Engendering of Marcel Duchamp. She recently curated the Stellar Sexual Politics Exhibition at the Armin Hammer Museum. She's a contributor to numerous journals, including Art History and Art and Text. She is currently finishing a book on 1970s body art. Amelia. Thank you. Is this, is this on? Well, that's a hard act to follow. That was really uh, eloquent and fascinating. And I actually also don't feel that comfortable kind of speaking about video because I mostly approach it through a very specific point of view. So I don't have a comprehensive knowledge of video history, but I thought I could just maybe play out some of the things that I find interesting. Um, in thinking about video, especially in relation to body art. I'm approaching it through the two categories of chronologies and of video. And again, these are just very sketchy thoughts. Chronologies, 1965, from the beginning of the introduction of video as a technology, and 1996. Um, I'm also interested in this issue of the introduction of video at an explosive historical and social moment in the way in which video, like minimalism, conceptualism, and body art, which all took place really at roughly the same time, responds to exacerbates and parallels massive shifts in the social psyche including, and this is what I'm the most interested in, which I think intersects what you were saying uh, in certain ways, including a profound rethinking of subjectivity. Um, I have the next section being the kind of the usual litany of these social historical shifts that we can think about in terms of this both technological but also philosophical events that are taking place during this early period, the mid to late 60s. This litany being late capitalist multi multinationalism, post-colonialism, uh, the civil rights movement, which of course is shifting into black power, the incipient gay, lesbian, and women's rights movements, the development of new technologies, again, uh, of representation, including computers and video. What I'm really interested in then is the cybernetic or technologized subject, what, what Donna Haraway calls the cyborg, which for me is specifically a particularized subject. And by that I mean it is a particular subject rather than a universal subject. The particularization of the subject, which of course has everything to do with civil rights and so on, has to do with the insistent enunciation of the I as particular rather than normative. And of course, the norm would, would have been at that time straight, white, male, middle class, et cetera, et cetera. As particular also rather than individual in the sense that that would have come to mean in the 1950s. That is promoting a, a kind of nth degree enlightenment conception of the self as a unified, coherent origin of meaning, and again as a normative, assumed to be normative subject. The subject rather becomes fragmented, dissolved, dispersed, all of those cliches of postmodernism. And yet again, I'm, I'm insistently pushing the fact that it's aggressively activist and particularized. That is, while the myth of coherent individuality, which in turn reinscribes universalism and the privileging of the norm, is profoundly questioned in this period, the subject simultaneously engages 
in her or his particularity in activist groups that aim to shift power structures and structures of belief. The centers of power in the West, on the one hand, become consolidated in obvious ways, uh, but also, I would argue, even to this day, are increasingly dispersed from within. And I think this is why we have the uh, frantic rhetoric on the part of the right of, about family values and so on, precisely because it's actually a lot less stable than they would like it to be. So then moving from this discussion of chronologies to a discussion of video, and in a certain sense I'm addressing ontological issues here. Video as writing, um, which you very nicely covered in terms of video being understood as part of the process of transcribing or inscribing memories, of testifying as a kind of mystic writing pad or testimonio. And I'm using language here that comes from two essays in the Resolutions book. One is Erica's essay, the other is Chan Noriega's essay on testimonio. Then there's the idea of video as an extension of film, and I also say photography here because the technological histories of film and photography are so intimately linked. That is video used to create smaller scale narrative stories as a cheaper and more accessible medium than film, which has instant feedback capabilities, which has profound ontological uh, implications. The link to the history of amateur photography, and I'm thinking here of the use of video for family videos, which is much more closely linked to the history of photography in that sense than uh, the history of film. And of course, the link of, vi link of video to commercial film. Video as an extension of television. Um, whether video is being made to be broadcast over television to reach large audiences, um, which would link it very closely to commercial film and television and its structures, or the use of television images within experimental videos, the most obvious case being Nam June Paik, so where he empties the television sign even more and uses it as a kind of pure formal element. Video as an extension of cybernetics, the interweaving of computer technologies with video to envision or fabricate, again, this particularized subject, the ways in which we experience ourselves differently in contemporary society. And I'm thinking here of the work of someone like Jennifer Steinkamp. This is a relatively uh, young area. And finally, the obvious video as art, uh, which coming at this as an art historian, is the aspect that is the most interesting to me, although, of course, all of these are very closely interwoven. I'm interested in uh, approaching video that addresses concerns from the visual arts with its codes, discourses, signs, and structures, but inevitably also always the filmic and the photographic, issues of storytelling, of making pictures through mechanical indexical means. And of course, also the televisual, the electronic code, and the capacity to create simulacral images that dislocate the referent from the, from the uh, sign. Video as a form of mediation, and those are the words of Tiffany Lopez, marking the gaps between the object and maker, the object and receiver, the signifier and the signified, and opening out or exaggerating the intersubjectivity of all meaning production. Now this is where it should be clear that I conceive of the, technolo the technologized subject, the subject that is articulated through what we think of as the high technologies of recent years as a particularized subject because it is articulated in its specificity. Video as an extension of body or performance art, and this is another way in which it's clear how the two are intertwined. Um, and I personally am very interested in phenomenological explorations of what constitutes or disperses the embodied self including an exploration of the inextricably embodied nature of the self and yet of the slipperiness of this body in terms of its social and cultural meanings as well as its subjectivity experienced. 
by itself. The intersubjective dimension, the arousal of spectatorial participation and desire, uh, what we might call via Craig Owens the rhetoric of the pose, uh, the way in which we perform ourselves. A lot of uh, very interesting video work deals with that as well. The ways in which uh, the ways in which both of these, the intersubjectivity and the performance of the self, orchestrate identity in relation to others and particularize identity again as an intersubjective in worlded process rather than a fixed quantity and also as a particular rather than a universalizable set of identities. Um, and I'm just, I'm thinking of any range of work here, anywhere from Linda Benglis, Vito Acconci, Bruce Nauman, Adrian Piper, Laura Aguilar, and any number of people who are most often addressing the, the physical presence of their body in the video and what that means in terms of this issue of particularization. Now with the white male artist, of course, it's not always uh, clear whether this was an intentional opening out. Um, and that's a complicated question that I write about in my, my book on body art. I think we have more of a tendency to see work by someone like Aguilar as obviously about a particularized subject. But what I'm saying is, by the late 60s, even Vito Acconci is particularized whether he likes it or not. Um, Chan Noriega again discusses this kind of work in, in the Resolutions book vis-a-vis -vis the Chicana, Chicano testimonial form of video, which is very much what Laura Aguilar's recent work is about, where the speaker engages others performatively in their discourse, which is never stable but nonetheless produces certain productive identifications. And finally, this is a very abstract idea, but I'd like to end the, this little spoken portion before I show you a couple of clips with a phenomenological idea of video itself as flesh. And I'm going to read you a brief quotation by Merleau Ponty. Our body is a being of two leaves, from one side a thing among things, and otherwise what sees them and touches them. It's double belongingness, belongingness to the order of the object and to the order of the subject reveals to us quite unexpected relations between the two orders. The body is visibility or flesh, sometimes wandering and sometimes reassembled. Where are we to put the limit between the body and the world since the world is flesh? My body as a visible thing is contained within the full spectacle, but my seeing body subtends this visible body and all the visibles with it. There is reciprocal insertion and intertwining of one in the other. And this is from his essay, The Intertwining, the Chiasm, which not incidentally probably was published in the early 60s. The flesh is about the reversibility of the self and the world in the most particular politicized sense. The self and its image, its representations, let's say through video, the self and its others. So the video as flesh might be one of the modes through which we experience ourselves and the world in the intertwining. Um, and now I'd like to show just two very brief clips, which I consider to be examples of body art, uh, but of course are also video pieces. And there is a very dynamic moment here where video becomes integral to uh, these projects in the visual arts. First, I'm going to show just a brief, uh, the first of four saliva studies uh, by Vito Acconci called Waterways from 1971, and then a clip from Hannah Wilkie's Gestures, uh, which is dated shortly thereafter. And both of these uh, have something to do with the way the body is produced through the video medium and then produces effects in the spectator. So if you could put the uh, Akanchi on, and you can just stop it when it gets to the, there's a black screen. No, this is, yeah, OK.
that one there. Can you put the Wilkie on, please? The is a video producer and director and former curator of video at Long Beach Museum of Art. She has exhibited and curated internationally, and she currently teaches art and technology and the history of video art at Art Center, UCSD, Cal State San Marcos, and the Otis Art Institute. a little bit like Sybil. Um, I feel somewhat schizophrenic being involved in the video arts as a producer and as a curator, programmer, uh, promoter, etc., teacher, educator, writer. Um, one of the things I would like to say to kind of augment what David James already presented is that for me, the advent of uh, video as a creative media medium coincided with two very important events in the arts, and the first of which was the initiation of the NEA, the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, I think this greatly encouraged artists to be involved with alternative media as an expression of creating work. The second and, and thus a, kind of a result of the beginnings of the NEA, was the birth of the alternative space, which occurred in, mainly on the two coasts, but then became a national kind of phenomenon. This is uh, pretty much the late 60s, early 70s, when this occurred. It also kind of coincided with the accessibility of the portaback, portable video equipment, which was still cost prohibitive for many artists but because of the National Endowment of the Arts, the Porter Pack was made accessible in museums and universities and public access centers for community use. So many artists of all different levels and experiences and backgrounds were able to approach uh, an alternative space or an access center and apply to use equipment, putting down a small deposit and creating video work. Um, my experience of involving myself within this medium was predominantly divided into, again, the schizophrenia. There were those who approached the medium as artists, authors, who wanted to work alone and create single works that represented their ideas or were sidebars to other expressions of ideas and concepts that existed in other media. Then there was the collaborative effort, the group effort, that recognized the beginnings of the end of authorship, the end of the artist commodity, and the beginning of a, co a cooperative and collaborative 
effort to create something meaningful. Um, the first recognized group of this, of this sort was the Rain Dance Foundation, which developed in TV, TV, Guerrilla Television, Irish Schneider, Paul Ryan, the ecological television movement. Um, I was in New York at this time, and my introduction to the electronic arts pretty much came through these two means. Being in Soho, seeing artists uh, perform in alternative spaces such as 112 Green Street, uh, uh, the ki art kitchen, artist space, uh, and also seeing the experimentation of collaborative groups like TVTV. TV. I wanted to bring this up because um, for me, this was very different from coming from the alternative film world. And even though David makes a point about um, video su superseding film, film was still very much a uh, supported and uh, respected medium for creating alternative artistic expression. And there were many more support systems to enable um, those working in the alternative arts and film to show their work and to get funding and support. Um, I brought these books just to give you an idea. Uh, and this isn't complete. There may be two books missing. <laughs> but this is the pretty much the library over 20 years of production for video art. Um, if you go into any used bookstore, into any existing bookstore into any library, you will find that film encompasses maybe two or three huge shelves of new publications daily. Video is always lumped in with technology and media discussion. Now there's tons of books and writings on media and our media environment and the demographic vistas of our society, but there's very little written about video art. Um, I wanted to show you a little bit of these and for those of you who are interested. Uh, there is one book that came before this called Video Art by the Rain Dance Foundation and Guerrilla TV, which is also by the Rain Dance Foundation. Uh, they are out of print and I no longer have my copies. Um, but this was the first book actually titled uh, New Artist Video that tried to create a critical discussion of video art and it was by, edited by Gregory Badcock. It is out of print and practically unobtainable. But at the beginning of this book, um, in his introduction, he says, what is video art? How does it differ from commercial television? Is video art linked to such traditional art forms as painting and sculpture? Is it a totally new phenomenon? What are the aims of video artists? How does one learn to make video artworks? What kind of equipment is needed? When did video art first appear and where is it going? This is in 1976. These questions are still being asked today in museums and in universities and galleries and in publications. Um, a very important book on the scene of video art was Expanded Cinema, edited by Gene Youngblood and written, most of it written by Gene Youngblood with an introduction by Buckminster Fuller. And I also want to bring up this point. For those of you who think video only came out of alternative cinema, it really did come out of the, altern the alternative art and technology movement. And part of the development of the NEA came from large corporate support for the mega art and technology projects, such as Bell Labs, the Media Lab and Television Studios, as well as uh, World's Fair art, um, expeditions, um, pavilions, and um, the EAT movement, experiments in art and technology. Um, in Jack Burnham's article about uh, the panacea of art and technology that's failed, uh, he makes a good point that yes, the art and technology movement of the late 60s failed, but out of it came performance art, conceptual art, and video art. Um, there are two distributors of video art for uh, a video artwork. One is Electronic Arts Intermix, which is another publication, which is a catalog of artists' works that they represent. 
um, electronic arts. Intermix came out of the art and technology movement, started by Howard Wise, who had an art gallery of art and technology artists, uh, kinetic artists, sound artists, and um, basically a precursor to MIT's Media Lab. And Video Data Bank, housed in the School of the Art Institute in Chicago, Illinois, is the other. Um, another recent book is Illumination, Illuminating Video, which was published in San Francisco by BayVac, Bay Area Video Coalition, and Doug Hall, Sally, Sally Jo Pfeiffer. At the moment, I can't order this at school. It's temporarily out of print. Expanded Cinema is out of print. John Hanhart's uh, Critical Investigation of Video Culture, which also has several media essays, is out of print. As far as support for the media arts and video in general, there are four media art curators in the United States. There are many more film departments in museums and in universities than there are video departments. Um, I was one of those four curators. My department has since been eliminated. I would like to show you a little bit about how video uh, was made accessible to a public, which was mainly through a television movement through um, WGBH in Boston and WNET in New York. KCET in LA chose not to support an artist experimentation movement at this time. So we have no examples um, from Los Angeles. But I'd like to show a brief tape um, that was done by w WGBH, which opened the public to uh, accepting the idea of video as a creative art form. Could I roll the first tape, please? But I'm kind of like now, it moves the eye. All the time, it just got me just and lyrics and lyrics. Finally, my parents had me committed. And uh, they tried all kinds of therapy. Finally, they set it on shock. And the doctors brought me into this room in a straight jacket because I was still, like this terrible, terrible temper. I was just the meanest cop you could imagine. And then when I took this cold metal electrode or whatever it was to my chest, I started to do that. And then when I shocked her, it froze my face into this smile. And even though I was still incredibly depressed, everybody thinks I'm happy. I don't know what I'm going to do. We've got uh, P A R K. Was spelled correctly. That was good. Really? And you spelled uh, O U T right. But when it came to beach, you spelled it E B E C H, which is like a, uh, well, there's a gun called Beach Nut Gun. But the correct spelling is we left beach like the sand. So it's, it should have been. The B, the B, A, C, A. See, that's the difference. Well, I'll say that to you. I remember the next thing. You do not have any Okay, that was aired in 1973 in a program called The Next Wave that was an hour-long program on video art by WGBH in Boston. Um, I just got in the mail a um, Signals magazine, a catalog for fans and friends of public television. It's basically uh, items that you can buy, like a regular mail order catalog, catalog. And in this it says, get your William Wegman marigolds, petunias, Weimar's shirts, six pups strike adorable poses in this 1989 portrait by artist William Wegman. If you're a Wegman fan, you know that he usually photographs his grown-up dogs, Fay Ray, Batty, Chungo, and Crookie. So this is a rare treat. T-shirts are white, 100% cotton, made in the U.S. 
$24, $26, $29 for a long tee, and for extra, extra large long tee, $32.50. Now I'd like to um, show the next tape, which is kind of a new version. Um, I mean, I'm trying to encompass 20 years and 15 minutes here. So I'm going to show the new version of, you know, friendly dog tape. And we will. started in video making, um, there was a certain kind of naivete, but empowerment to be, being part of this new movement and definition of using a new medium. And uh, yes, there was difficult of as, as, access and distribution. Um, it was very hard to get involved in more sophisticated equipment. You were not embraced by the art world. You were not accepted by the television community. Um, but you kind of created a specialized identity that was not dissimilar to the idea of what an avant-garde is. And uh, dealing with this idea of being involved in a movement to work with new technology as a tool and a medium was something that appealed to me greatly. Now, 20 years later, video, as we know, has become more of an accessible tool that is viewed in terms of its empowerment as a weapon, as evidence, as we've seen in several instances. Um, for those of us who see the end of, of video as a creative medium, the possibilities for single channel work. Now, Bruce is going to talk more about uh, installation, but uh, I'm focusing mainly on single channel works that we're really dealing with the kind of ideologies of, you know, getting out to the masses and, and being carried out uh, onto a one-to-one -one relationship to, to the viewer. Um, I think these days are over, but yet what also came along, as Burnham said, you know, the art and technology movement failed. Well, maybe video art failed as well. But what it's opened up, I think, is the possibility of really accepting this idea of communication and collaboration. I see a lot of potential on the web. I mean, how many people here are online? Can I see a show of hands? It's pretty good. I mean, in 1985, I asked a group of people in a room how many had a VCR. I saw about the same number of hands. So I think um, there's a great potential for that. And I'd like to show the last tape, which is kind of a statement about information and creative potential. Thank <laughs> you. 
So we're entering a time when artists are no longer being called artists, but are being called content providers. And uh, I think it's a serious time to really analyze and think about, for example, this article in the LA Times on October 13th about art, uh, digital art firms that are looking overseas for workers because they find that the digital art graphic artists here don't have enough of an art background. Um, I, I see a, a commingling of uh, government and corporation and, um, and so-called art creation with new technologies mingling yet again. Um, this has been the whole history ever since the art and technology movement began and we haven't obviously left it for too long. We are returning to it again. So it's time to develop a language. It's time to develop um, a support system for those who want to still create and experiment with these new media. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Bruce Yamamoto, who is a widely exhibited video maker who, in collaboration with his brother Norman, has produced an extensive body of video work, both in single channel feature length videotapes and in installations that have been internationally exhibited. The feature video made in Hollywood will be screened as part of the AFI and LACE Video Festival on October 26th. Uh, there will also be a mid-career survey of their work, uh, which will be the inaugural exhibition in 1998 of the Japanese American National Museum. Bruce. Thank you, Erica, and, and thank you to the Bannon Foundation and LACE for this series. Um, I'd also like to thank David for the uh, mention, and, and coming last is always sort of difficult because people have sort of gone over some similar material, but I'll just go on anyway. Um, <laughs> In 1964, Namjoon Pike went to Tokyo and picked up one of the first reel-to-reel -reel porta packs off the assembly line at Sony. So began the history of video in the hands of artists. Some say that this consumer technology enabled artists to go outside to record the world as landscape. Others saw the beginning of a new psychological medium, a medium which, like a mirror, could objectify the self. I want to stress the word objectify and more to the point, the object. In her seminal 1978 article video, The Aesthetics of Narcissism, which is in one of those outdated books, Rosalind Krauss suggested that many of the early works of video set up a virtual technology which could be seen as a model for the creation of an object slash self. Unlike the other visual arts, video is capable of recording and transmitting at the same time, producing instant feedback. The body is therefore as if it were centered between two machines that are the opening and closing of a parenthesis. The first of these, these is the camera, the second is a monitor, which reprojects the performance image with the immediacy, immediacy of a mirror. So could you put on the first tape, but lower the sound? Because I'm gonna talk over it a little bit. It's a tape by Bruce Nauman, well, it says, in 1968. Self, Lacan begins by characterizing the space of the therapeutic transaction as an extraordinary void. This is from the Krauss article, created by the silence of the analyst. Into this void, the patient projects the monologue of his own recitation, which Lacan calls a monumental construct of his narcissism. Using this monologue to explain himself in a situation to a silent listener, the patient begins to experience a very deep frustration. And this frustration, Lacan charges, although it is initially thought to be provoked by the maddening silence of the analyst, is eventually discovered to have another source. What the patient comes to see is that the self of his is a projected object and that his frustration is due to his own capture by this object with which he can never really coincide. The process of analysis is one of breaking the hold of this fascination with the mirror and in order to do so, the patient comes to see the distinction between his lived subjectivity and the fantasy projections of himself as object. 
What interests me about this analysis is the insistence on the creation of an object, granted an objectified one, but nonetheless seen as an object of video. You can turn up the audio a little bit, I guess. It just... keeps on going on and on. But uh, what I would like to propose is that perhaps in this age of diminished funding, as Carol Ann uh, spoke of, and exhibition venues, we in the field of video art are seeing a disappearance, a disappearance of the programmatic forms, forms based on continuity, such as the deconstruction of narrative, political activism, the diaristic. In other words, anything with a beginning, middle, and end anything that could resemble sitting down and watching a movie in a dark theater, and that perhaps we are seeing a return to video as object. Okay, let's see the next tape. Cheryl Dunnigan can somewhat be related to Bruce Nauman's, it is clear that the objectification goes beyond the mirror of herself. Her milk, her milk bottle is clearly a laundry detergent container, and her physical adjustments are made around this consumerist entity. She is clearly concerned with the object which feeds her objectified self. 
One can suggest that the demise of the programmatic has come about by the rise of television's remote control. We are no longer physically in bondage by a lack of initiative to walk to the TV and change the channel. This is now instantaneous, or should I say simultaneous, or perhaps the demise, this demise has been acerbated by the rise of new media, the infinite non -sec sequiturs available in cyberspace. So perhaps a new televisual model is, not, is no longer the mirror slash object of the closed circuit, but a model suggested by Henri Bergson in, in Matter and Memory, the, the sugar cube slash object. According to Bergson, we perceive those parts of an object that are useful to us and suppress the perception of those parts of an object which are not. Everything thus happens for us as though we reflected back to surfaces the light which emanates from them. The light which, had it passed unopposed, would never have been revealed. It is as if we were conscious mirrors selectively reflecting the, those parts of an object that appeal to action and letting the light form the rest of the object pass through us. It follows that if an object no longer appeals to any action on our part, we would not reflect any light back to the object and that object would be invisible. So could you put on the last tape? I guess his point is, is, what's the last time you watched the sugar cube dissolving? And that you just sort of, you perceive the, the state when you put it in the water and then after it's disappeared. Okay. So in return, our return to television as object and the demise of the programmatic is perhaps due to, the, to a realization that many artists working in video already know that the self is no longer the projected object on video, but that the self is actually created by the reflection of the media. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to open uh, this discussion up to panelists to discuss with you and any questions that you may have or statements. I will be repeating them since the sound is very strange for us and probably even stranger for you. Um, so if you'd like to, it would be helpful if you have a question, if you could stand, uh, and then I can either run to you with a microphone or read your lips. Or if the panelists have any questions of each other.
gotten out of their days more or less. Um, and then I remember in 1970, the first time I held a board back, and, and I, I held up a little it, and, and I could just feel in that thing the Rodney King case. I mean, I just, I just knew that something like that was going to happen sooner or later. What, when you discuss market capital, I, 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 I feel a little bit in a bust down paradigm, which I, I, gee, when I think about mammals, you got blue whales, you got kangaroo rats, there are things that don't want to fuck around with you, the wall of hairs that, that you, you know, you want to kiss. I sort of feel that way. sure of, of, the, of the resonances of your question, uh, the, the place I'll start is your proposal that I perceive something of an us-them paradigm in terms of the relationship between working people and corporate capital. And the way you phrased it, it seemed that you wanted to, uh, you were uncomfortable with that paradigm, with that us-them binary. I guess I'm not uncomfortable with the analysis. I might be comfortable in the position to which I'm assigned by corporate capital but I don't see any fundamental, any possibility of any fundamental reconciliation between the interests of working people and the interests of capitalists and capital in general. So um, I'm very much concerned to, uh, not only to not to increase that binary because that's outside of my power, but to increase public awareness of that binary since we live in a society in which there are massive industries created specifically by corporate capital to obfuscate that division and to uh, instigate competing divisions amongst us. So if, if that was the thrust of your question, um, I very much hope that we will all, even more in future, um, think in terms of an irreconcilable difference between our interests and those of, of bankers and capitalists in general. Yes. I uh, am probably out of the uh, but where in the Los Angeles area, where do video artists exhibit their art? And number two, uh, I am interested in uh, KCET, uh, not during uh, or uh, presenting or having a video venue. I would like to know uh, your feelings on why. Do you want to talk about galleries and then we'll talk about talent? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, well, that's two different subjects, but first, in direct answer to your question about KCT, um, in reading about the early television lab experiments, there was a footnote that said KET, KCT did not um, do any creative programming other than programs on artist and art, which is different than enabling artists to take over studios and create programs. So that was the difference I was talking about. There have been programs on the arts and about artists on KCET, but this was the early 70s and into the 80s, and there was nothing as specific as a production lab for artists to work with them. Does KCET offer its facilities or its airtime to? Uh, it doesn't offer facilities because it is union. And unless you're a member of the union, you cannot work on the facilities. But you can be hired as an independent producer to produce a program working in tandem with or in collaboration with their staff of technicians. And there have been productions that were independently produced that were bought and then aired on KCT, which is separate again 
there, from there. There, is, there are ways to see video art on, on television, particularly public television, but they're dwindling from, for example, the period that Carol Ann is talking about where there's a great deal of experimentation and commitment. Um, I'm trying desperately to think of the ones that are left alive, which is aired on KCET very, very late at night, is one of the last places to see video art. And actually, KCET has a, has a main programmer, uh, actually two programmers, that do get a, a certain amount of local video art on the air. And they have, in conjunction with LA Freeways, which is one of the largest and and most interesting places for you to actually go and look at video art next to LACE, which is another uh, important venue for that. Um, and KCT has actually broadcast LA freeways on the air, which is a fairly new phenomena for them. So there are some, there are some venues, but Caroline's point about them dwindling in direct relation to state support is a very important one. If you look at the National Association of Media Arts Centers, um, uh, brochure and their listing, it dwindles year by year and right now it's about this thin. Um, so even the spaces in Los Angeles have been cut considerably um, to the point that many of them don't exist even from five years ago. Just so that you know um, why there might be a problem with showing single channel work in many museums, um, I'm not trying to make a discussion of film versus video here, it's just a, a reality of the medium, is that the American Association of Museums, which is kind of the, the, uh, the organization that does sanctify a museum as being a museum, defines a museum as an organized and permanent nonprofit institution, essentially educational or aesthetic in purpose with professional staff who, which owns and utilizes tangible objects, it's my <laughs> emphasis, cares for them and exhibits them to the public on some regular schedule. That's the definition of a museum. Um, unfortunately, a lot of uh, video art doesn't come under the heading of tangible object. And video has had a history of being somewhat ghettoized within the museum, relocated to an area that's occasionally designated with little gray plastic chairs, not dissimilar to the ones you're sitting on, and a television monitor with very bad sound coming through the speaker of the TV. And in fact, when I worked at the Long Beach Museum, I had calls from ma very many reputable institutions asking, you know, if they could borrow equipment. You know, they don't even own equipment anymore. They don't feel it's a good investment. So it's something that I think about almost on a daily basis, is that a medium which always had a difficult time in terms of definition and exhibition and distribution is now being seen by many institutions is over, dead, is what they call it. Video art is dead. And as we know, we've heard painting is dead, so it's a, it's a similar kind of discussion. But the problem is, video is so dependent upon, you know, um, accessibility and distribution. And that's a whole other discussion we can get into if you want about alternatives to that. But in, in answer to your question about where can you see very, video art, very, very few places. Yes. Yeah, the question is about public access and cable in terms of how, why it's not showing video art. Does anybody wish to answer that? It's well, kind of like, did the tree fall in the forest? <laughs> public access is out there and you never know who sees it, who supports it, what the feedback is. <laughs> No, you're within your own community. There is a little bit more of an, an insulated kind of discussion, whereas public access, the advent of cable in the 80s offered all this promise, and it just turned out to be a franchise agreement that really didn't ever blossom into a big um, way of getting art ideas out to a public. The public was invisible and remained so. But after, um, the only stuff I'm aware of is like the Chris Burden stuff. Are there people who still 
try to do TV work like that through public access or no? I don't even have cable, so. There, there are artists, for example, Paper, Paper Tiger Television is a group that work with um, creating an alternative to commercial television, especially news and commentary. Right. Um, as far as artists working creatively within cable, some do through, again, alternative spaces in different cities using their local cable station. It really has to do with the franchise agreement of what city and what cable company and how accessible it is. It's, it doesn't seem very viable right now in the 90s. And it's fairly, I mean, not, not to get, not to continue on, I mean, a very bleak situation, because unfortunately it is, and we can't lie about that, um, is that Long Beach Museum of Art had, had the international profile uh, in terms of the exhibition, the curation, and the commissioning of new work, and they no longer do this, so to the extent that they used to. And they no longer, to my knowledge, have a media arts curator unless they slipped one in in the last few months, but yes. The question is, why did they end their support for video art? Um, I'm probably not the right person to ask that question to, but um, I can tell you that the, the video program raised a lot of money for the museum and the institution for many years, and uh, when it became apparent that the NEA sent out its message that there was not going to be specialized funding anymore. In other words, an institution such as a museum could only apply for one thing, and that would cover all of its aspects. Um, it became apparent it wasn't going to be video art. Um, it would mainly be education, because that's kind of the buzzword right now in terms of funding and getting money. So that sent out a message that maybe the gravy days were over and that general operating, operating support, which has always been the primary concern, wasn't going to be substantiated by video art. Could, could I ask you a question? <laughs> <laughs> you okay, me? Yeah. Oh. I've, I've learned so much from this discussion. I'm sure I've learned much more than anybody in the audience. But um, in preparation for this, I read a lot of stuff that had been written about video. Um, in the past uh, a couple of decades and regularly came across essays which talked about the utopian possibilities of uh, uh, cable and satellite, especially things like uh, deep dish TV. And uh, some of the articles about that, maybe some even revolution in resolutions, um, um, proposed this as the kind of beginning the, of, a, of a whole new participatory public sphere. Could you talk a little bit about what's happened to deep dish and uh, do we have any figures for the audiences? Do we have any sense of, of, of what kind of effect it has on, uh, on public opinion at all? Anne, do you want to answer that? You're shaking your head. Does that mean you have the statistics well, at hand? I, I was talking to them recently, and they're doing free speech TV is growing. It's like amazing. Mean, and it's like David Ross, in 1973, in an interview with Michael Opping, talked about the fact that the reason why video as an alternative medium within television wasn't supported is that unlike the film, the beginnings of alternative film, where a discussion was already established amongst, amongst makers, even though it was becoming very commercially viable, there was a known language. Video 
never really had that. And so a lot of people, and if those of you who ever dealt with a subject that needed press, you know if you don't hand the press the exact description of what they should say in a language that they know how to talk about, they're not going to write about it. It's too hard. And this seems to have been a constant lament of those involved in, in video art, is that there isn't a language. People talk about media again. They talk about media, but they don't talk about what's contained within video. The other problem I'd like to mention is that video artist work is seen usually in compilation tapes with the context that's created by people such as myself. And very rarely do you see the whole body of work of one artist. So you get a sense of what the concepts and what they're trying to articulate. So that's also a problem, I think, in terms of getting the feedback um, on things that are aired on television. Yeah, I think that to follow up is, is that there is no critical studies department video in any university of the United States. But there are many, of course, of course, there are many in film. Uh, there, there has been some proposed. I know that John Hanhart, at the, who's the curator of film and video at the Guggenheim now, moved from the Whitney, wanted to start one of these centers, and I think he was trying very hard at UCSD, but it wasn't able to be passed through. So I think that the, it is a critical juncture in terms of the, uh, the definition of the forum, as you know, experimental film had a specific juncture also. And, and so if these texts or whatever are published and there is this concentration of academic energy uh, put towards it, then perhaps uh, you know, there could be some historical or auteur type, as Carol Ann was mentioning, uh, theory sort of imposed on it in order to distribute the ideas. Yeah, I'd like to say something about that, and I don't want this to uh, uh, collapse into a, a me against Carol Ann saying, you know, film is in a worse position, video is in a worse position. But I think it's a little bit misleading to say, well, there was all this institutional attention given to film and none to video. Because if we make that model a little bit more complicated, we'll see that there's a tremendous amount of institutional attention given to Hollywood film, to, yeah. to feature film in general. And there is a considerable amount of uh, attention now given to television. Uh, tele I work in a school of cinema television, and in my professional body, the number of people writing and studying te television is increasing enormously, it's replacing film. So the issue is not really video against film, it's the common situation of experimental or marginalized film and video art on the one hand, and the domination of these kinds of apparatuses by, on the other hand, feature film, and on the other hand, broadcast television. Yes. There's two, there's two levels of entry, which you're talking about, you know, as, as a creative artistic tool and then as an accessible power tool, which is what I was kind of alluding to. Um, a lot of third world countries, for lack of a better term, are inheriting our discarded technologies and they are creating new experimental works, which is why I travel and look at new works done outside of the United States. Um, they're very interesting. Um, in terms of how they re are re-articulating the use of those technologies. But artists are always interested in the new. You know, they're always wanting to move ahead. And so, 
Yes, there, well, that is a, one of the technologies that's used, but they're also interested in the new within that technology. So, you know, it's always a rearticulation to move ahead, and it's very much tied, again, you know, to the system, whatever system it is, whether it be the art market or the television world. But I wanted to bring a little bit of full circle here. Um, David showed the, the union um, labor tape, and interestingly, the artist television movement in New York City started at the Center uh, for Union Bargaining, the Machinist Union. And they created in their basement an art and technology room um, where the Center for non Television began and the Artist Cable Network began. And so there's always been kind of a, um, an embrace between the struggle of um, rights and uh, collaborative efforts within communities, as well as the creative experimental work. The biggest people who have helped within these areas, for example, in terms of giving access, are churches, libraries, and community centers, for both. So I just wanted to point that out. And I, I just wanted to point out again that I think that perhaps not one of the problems, but certainly one of the the uh, developments in terms of video is once again the demise of this idea of the programmatic, of the program, sitting down and watching something with a beginning, middle, and end. And I think that people, at least I am that way too, you know, no longer watch television in that way. I mean, I, I no longer watch television in terms of sitting down like I sit down in a movie, which is total mind control. I mean, you, you, you know, you invest a lot of time when you go see a movie and you are controlled by that medium. And uh, I feel that certainly television and, uh, and video art or whatever have you, in terms of the programmatic, in terms of this program idea, perhaps is at a juncture that is at an end. And I think that the cyberspace or the, the new technology certainly point to that also, because it, it, you just turn it off, basically, when you're done. You know, you don't end it, you know. You're right, with the new technologies, you never leave the terminal. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, you go to sleep or something like that. Some and, you know, that's it. But also, look at the way video is used on the web. I mean, yeah. the web doesn't yeah. preclude video. It's actually a major yeah. part you of a lot quick of... quick time. Yeah, with these yeah. little... I mean, it's becoming increasingly capable of processing larger and larger clips. Mm -hmm. Well, with real-time streaming protocol is what they breaking, call it. Breaking video into these yeah. bits that can be integrated into these non-linear structures. Right. Yeah, so that, it's a yeah. really different way of conceiving... I mean, I think your model is right, that it's not a beginning and an end. It's, right. a, it's a loop in Right, and, and I think that that's one of the reasons why perhaps there is such an interest in installation or video as installation is because it no longer is a program, it's an object. And that's, you know, regardless if it's collectible or whatever have you, which it is, of course, but it is, it, it, it's not this program anymore. So perhaps that is, you know, what is at an end is the actual idea of a program rather than video, art, or anything like that. One thing I meant to bring up, which I, I think is an important issue, is preservation, too. Is that videotape has about a seven-year shelf life, and then it just breaks up and dissolves. And a lot of people who make home movies and put their weddings, <laughs> what have you, don't realize that those memories, histories may dissolve and not be there um, as much as they think that they might be. And video artists, it's the same thing, you know. Um, there's been a recently a conference on preservation and uh, the, the, the acknowledgement that videotape may not exist in the next 10 years, I mean, as a medium at all. So it will go the way of the typewriter and the, you know, eight deck. I mean, I, I think it's, a, it's something to consider in terms of working within any creative medium. You know, is the equipment to play it back even going to exist? But it can all be recorded digitally. Yeah. Right? It's not the same. It's not? No. Well, do you think film on video is the same? No. Is the difference is great? It's it's similar difference in terms of the read. I'd like to interject 
to invite you to come and talk about video installation as well, which is the next panel in this series, and also to end by coming to the third panel in the series, which is Bill Viola talking about his work. Um, I'd like to thank you for coming, and I would encourage people who have other things to talk to the panelists about, perhaps to do that informally, and I appreciate your attention and thank the panelists as well for